Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I am looking at Project Orion, specifically the Project Orion mod created by Nyrath, which is quite possibly the most Kerbal propulsion system ever envisaged. It was originally imagined apparently in uh, 1946 by none other than Stanislav Ulam, who of course went on to help design the hydrogen bomb. And yeah, it's really awesome. It is nuclear bombs exploding underneath this pusher plate to push the vehicle vertically. Now, of course, there's a slight bug that caused my nuclear engines to fire, so I switched over, but I decided I wasn't going fast enough, so I fired a more powerful version. And that more powerful version immediately shot me up to ridiculous speeds, and the shock was just too much for that poor pusher plate to manage. Separated my spacecraft into two parts, which of course can only result in disaster, right? There's a long fall back, regardless. <laughs> it did not get very far. But the thing about Orion designs, or, or nuclear pulse rocket is the correct name, is that they are one of the few designs of, of rockets which are within our technological grasp. You know, we basically have understand every single part of them, more or less. But they can provide high specific impulse and high thrust. Which is very important. You know, we have high specific impulse engines in the form of ion engines, right? But they're very low thrust, and we have you know things like Saturn V engines, you know, standard chemical rockets that provide a lot of thrust, but they have really lousy efficiency. And if you remember my light speed video, the amount of fuel that you would need to you know get up to near light speed was more than the entire mass of the universe itself. So here I have a nuclear rocket, a nuclear pulse rocket built on top of this mod, which was created by Nairith. Uh, it basically has a bunch of different fuel types. They come in these cylindrical packs. You can be lazy like me and um, just use the 3.5 uh, kilonewton or meganewton packs. Uh, the larger ones provide a bigger bump, but I'm just going to set this thing up with a kill rotation on the autopilot. It actually is incredibly hard to turn. You'll see that I have a whole stack of RCS tanks there. And uh, where we are going is we are gonna try and go to Jewel. Now you see where it is there? It's actually pretty well lined up with us. Now, it's actually behind us in the orbit. In fact, it's about 180 degrees away from where we would want Jewel to be if we were going to perform a simple home and transfer orbit, but this is a nuclear rocket with ridiculous amounts of delta V. It has several hundred kilometers per second of delta V. And I can literally just point my nose in the approximate direction of Joule and go, you know, full thrust until I've got a pretty close encounter and then trim once I'm there. No need to worry about, you know, coming around, about phase angles or any of that stuff. Just point and click. And by click, I mean explode things, and away it goes at ridiculous speeds here. This thing that I think is using the 20 meganewton explosives, that's vastly more powerful than the regular 3.5 that they originally talked about. One of the nice things about the, um, well about this is you can load it up with different, different uh, yields or whatever. But it turns out that when, they, you know, when you looked at these things, you pretty much need the same amount of fissionable material, but you can uh, adjust the amount of, you know, fusion fuel to it and uh, basically build variable yield warheads so that you can adjust the amount of thrust you're getting just by essentially tweaking it. And uh, it's actually really interesting that it doesn't matter pretty much how big you build this. The amount of, you know, uranium and plutonium or whatever you need is roughly the same for the smaller ones versus the larger ones because the smaller ones use less efficient explosives, right? The, the larger ones get more of their energy from fusion, therefore they don't need so much fissionable material. But there it is! Look at this, we're up at like, you know, three to a kilometers per second already. We have basically achieved escape velocity and you can see that we're going backwards along our orbit. Now, if we keep this up, we will fall into the sun, but that's okay because we're gonna keep going after that and we're gonna go even further off towards Joule. 
So yeah, anyway, it, as I said, it was originally conceived, supposedly in secret, in like 1946 or thereabouts. But um, later on, it was actually picked up by Freeman Dyson, who's, you know, one of those great celebrated physicists too. Of course, uh, he's also the guy behind the concept of the Dyson Sphere. This is someone who does, you know, likes to think big, let's say. So uh, the idea of propelling a rocket using nuclear explosions is probably right up his alley. So yeah, he was a... Uh, he basically worked on that for a couple of years, but then in 1963 the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty basically meant that it couldn't be developed, you know, into a conventional... It couldn't be developed at that point because of international treaties. And there was also the problem that, you know, the US in the 1950s couldn't see a reason why they would want to launch 8,000 tons of spacecraft into space, given that they hadn't even got around to, you know, launching <laughs> launching Mercury, or even Vostok for that matter. But yeah, you can see here the plate is oscillating in and out. The idea is you're exploding nuclear bombs near that plate and it's absorbing the force. The design that they came up with actually used specially designed warheads that formed a shaped charge, more like a nuclear shaped charge, which is quite a concept. It is actually a core requirement for building hydrogen bombs, apparently. The the understanding of how to shape the explosion from a, a fission warhead so that it actually triggers a fusion explosion. So presumably adjusting these things to, you know, preferentially fire along one axis isn't uh, such a problem. They would, uh, yeah, they would, the force would be absorbed by that plate and then the force would actually itself be something like 100 Gs, but they would allow the plate to move and oscillate back and forth uh, at a certain rate. The idea being the shock wave would be transmitted more carefully to the pilot, so they wouldn't be feeling the 15 plus Gs every pulse that this thing is showing. <laughs> These poor Kerbals are apparently not going to be enjoying themselves. Yeah, look at this, we're now like 14 kilometers per second relative to planet Kerbin, and we are moving off. We still haven't got our, our dual trajectory yet. You can see, of course, in the nav ball where we're gonna have to aim eventually. The idea is that we're, this uh, is actually slightly in front of its orbit, so eventually we will get a close encounter, then we'll just trim the orbit using the smaller nukes from that point. I mean, it's important to realize, right, that the smallest you can make this vehicle is basically dependent on how small a nuclear weapon you can build. And there is a certain minimal size at which you, a certain minimal amount of fissionable material you need to make a nuclear weapon that will explode, right? Uh, you know, and you're basically then from that point on, you're adding, you know, fusion payload to make it more powerful. But, um, you know, the smallest thing I think they, they came up with was a, a, like a 300 ton spacecraft that was using, uh, would have about 500 bombs and each of those would be uh, about 200 kilograms each. Um, but re really, you know, their designs went all the way up to like flying cities that would be, you know, half a kilometer wide and mass 8,000 tons. You know, they, they went all the way up to the scale, up the scale. But uh, you know, this is this is model here that they're using is actually probably smaller even than the uh, smallest ones that they, they could figure, right? So it's not totally to scale. I would like, you know, a more realistic one that's maybe, you know, 40 meters, meters across is in the base plate. But uh, we all know that Kerbal Space Program doesn't behave well with those large uh, objects. And we can see we now have a a close encounter that is getting closer as these things fire at some point will uh, we'll cut the main engine. <laughs> the throttle is does in fact work on this, you know. So there we go. Look, we actually got an encounter. And I pretty much didn't have to do anything but hold this surface attitude. There we go. Now I've turned off the, the big bombs and we're switching to the smaller bombs because we need to figure out what we're doing here. This will take a whole bunch of work, a whole bunch of maneuvering, which is why it's going to run at four times normal speed. This thing turns incredibly slowly. It is a hugely massive vehicle that, um, well, it turns like a giant block of metal that's being pounded by nuclear weapons, right? <laughs> anyway, so the Orion spacecraft was originally envisaged as being uh, something that could be used around the solar system, right? And they 
the original papers they looked at missions all the way out to Saturn, but one of the you know extensions of this is that if you build an appropriate spacecraft, you can probably get them up to uh, you know well you know decent fractions of the speed of light, right? You could build a spacecraft that could get to a few percent of the speed of light, you know, using um, well you know three hundred and sixty-seven billion dollars was the estimate in 1968 okay so there's been inflation since then but you know it doesn't actually seem that far beyond ridiculous does it i mean theoretically the uh, the ultimate speed of these things including you know speed up and slow down time is probably you know five to ten percent of the speed of light uh, you know if you're just going to speed up and you're not going to slow down ten percent is doable you know, Carl Sagan uh, famously said that it would be an excellent and far more noble use of the world's stockpiles of nuclear weapons, which largely have acted as nothing more than a deterrent uh, while sitting around not doing very much. And anyway, we aren't going nearly as far. We've, we're just going to the dual system because it's the easiest target, really, for these, you know, it has a very large sphere of influence. But anyway, after the, you know, this preliminary work, uh, the, the engineers basically coined the Project Orion. And this is no relation to the crew capsule Orion. This is, you know, the nuclear propulsion system we we're obviously talking about. Now, the they actually went out and they started working on engineering designs. They came up with the whole pusher plate concept, which originally they thought it would just be like springy airbags. But what they realized was that... Uh, if they missed a detonation, if there was a, a bomb that didn't go off, then the rebound could actually tear the plate off. So they in, in, they designed a vastly more complicated detuned piston system. The idea was that it would be not have a resonant frequency which was the same as the bombs they were firing, because that in itself could be dangerous. They had to come up with a method for deploying the bombs. And in fact, they supposedly talked to Coca-Cola about the internal architecture for, you know, how to move these kind of bombs, which were very much like large soda cans, apparently. <laughs> they wanted to figure out how to move these around the inside of a spaceship, so they thought, oh, that's just like a vending machine. Let's talk to Coca-Cola about it. Uh, ultimately, they came up with that their plan was to fire the bombs through a, mid a hole in the middle of the plate, and uh, after every firing, they would, you know, close up uh, like a co cone to protect it and deflect the blast. But uh, most of the force would be absorbed by the pusher plate and then ultimately transferred up to the spacecraft itself. And look, this is me kind of going around into orbit. Uh, it is really not great for um, for fine trim maneuvers. I'm going to just try and put it into an equatorial orbit. And this takes a small, a lot of small trims here and there, but ultimately it's possible. Um, the bombs themselves would not explode right at the plate. They would travel you know, a fair distance away from it before they exploded. Uh, you don't want to have it too close because otherwise too much of the, the plasma is too hot and it causes more you know, damage to your plate. Although all the designs, except the really biggest ones, worked with the idea of the plate being ablated over time. They did design one which had a, a plate that would not ablate and would be cooled passively. It was something like, you know, 20 kilometers across, so not the most compact vehicle ever designed. And actually, they did build um, test models of this, right? They actually built a test design which used chemical explosive pellets. They would fire it and explode it. And there's supposedly one which flew for like 20 seconds and it went something like, you know, 100 and something feet in the air. And it returned to the planet on a, or returned to the ground. It didn't really leave the planet. But it returned to the ground on a parachute. And, uh, you know, it supposedly is in a, a museum somewhere. I think it's in the Smithsonian, but I'm not sure about that. There is a video out there, but I'm not sure I have the rights to show you it, so I'm not going to include it here. I'm going to leave finding the video as an exercise to the reader. So anyway, now we are in orbit. It is time for us to perform this landing. The, the landing is more or less left as an exercise to the reader, right? <laughs> now, seriously, we've done all this before. Rather stupidly, I have only brought these the fuel tanks for this. I haven't brought giant fuel tanks on this design. Uh, that was rather stupid. Val was just the first uh, moon that I got a, an encounter with. 
And also, <laughs> um, because it's a stage further out or stage removed from the spacecraft, its RCS was burned up first, so it has no RCS left on it. I'm going to have to dock this thing without the need for RCS. Ah, it's not like I've never done that before. But yes, I mean, you know, this is an example of a mission we have so much delta v in the parent spacecraft all, all we have to all we have to land is the the smaller spaceship the we can car leave everything else in orbit since this thing turns incredibly slowly or since the parent spaceship turns incredibly slowly there's not much point in trying to land on it in fact you will see that it is an incredibly dangerous idea to land where your main um main propulsion is nuclear weapons because the weapons were designed to explode some distance past the pusher plate, but if you land on that pusher plate, then the ground is immediately below it and there's now no space to detonate. So you need extra long lander legs. And the lander legs can't sit out there normally because you have a nuclear explosion there which will chop your legs off. So best to leave this thing in space and have uh, all your, you know, have other spacecraft land on the surface. There we go, a little excursion to the surface using those much-loved nuclear rockets. Now, of course, these nuclear rockets are less efficient than a nuclear propulsion, a nuclear pulse rocket, because these are basically a nuclear reactor with hydrogen being passed over it and the hydrogen is being heated to provide thrust. But that means the nuclear core can't get too hot, otherwise it will melt. With a nuclear pulse production propulsion system, the bombs basically heat themselves up into a plasma that's millions of degrees centigrade in about, you know, a millisecond or less. And that blob of plasma expands, pushing against the rocket and pushing it forwards. Of course, I did try landing one of these things on the moon by hand. This was a, an earlier design, let's say. Um, it is very hard to maneuver, as I pointed out. Look at all that RCS just firing, trying to keep myself somewhat under control here. We're going to try and land it on the lunar surface and we're just killing velocity very carefully. Notice the thrust is way, way down on this thing. I think it might actually be using the 20 meganewton versions. I had one of these with the, the 400 meganewton and those things would literally tear the spacecraft apart half the time if you fired them at ground level. Not so much because of the acceleration, more because of the wind resistance. So there we are, we're just going to try and bring this thing down as carefully as possible. <laughs> and yes, we're completely blasting a hole in the moon here. Yep. Come on. Adjust yourself. Oh dear, this is not good. Of course, I mean the animation on this, I'm not sure how it works, but it does appear that the center of mass moves because you can see the camera moving. Uh, I'm wondering just exactly how the physics of the plate is simulated. Also, the, the plate, I think, should move more in a sinusoid, shouldn't it? There, look! Oh. That was a perfect landing, but the thing just disintegrated. I call shenanigans! That is not cool. Well, look, here we go. Try to land this thing on its back, at least, so Jebediah can get out. That is not cool. Yep, and there goes the rest of the rocket rolling away there. Well, it is Jebediah. I'm sure he can come up with a way to get home. Now, it may surprise you to know that this wasn't the most Kerbal thing I did with this pack. No, the most Kerbal vehicle award goes to this nuclear pulse rocket powered aircraft. I didn't have the procedural wings mod installed. I did have the fire spitter wings, which is why we use the the K-17 bomber wings and a whole bunch of them. You'll notice that the tail drags a little, oh, and it makes it very hard to get into the air, but that probably wins all sorts of prizes for the scariest aircraft launch ever. I mean, when you account for the nuclear explosions and bits falling off the aircraft. So yeah, I lost some of my wings, but look, it's flying. It is a nuclear pulse rocket powered plane. Now, one of my problems with this is that it was terrible to maneuver. I could roll it pretty well, but it wouldn't want to pitch up and down regardless how I moved the wings. But then I realized that if I added this extra set of wings slightly higher up, then it would naturally want to curve towards these wings. So basically I created an aircraft which always wanted to pitch up and by rolling over, 
I was able to adjust itself into somewhat level flight. <laughs> so there you have it, the most Kerbal of aircraft using the most Kerbal of propulsion systems. It is an Orion Nuclear Pulse aircraft. <laughs> it's only using the 3.5 mega newton um, yield devices. I'm not actually sure what that corresponds to and I'm presuming when it says mega newton that's mega newton seconds because of course you have to multiply newtons by time to actually get the actual change in momentum. Regardless, yes we're gonna try and land it at this airfield. You see I flipped this thing completely upside down so I can pitch downwards. <laughs> <laughs> it does actually fly. I mean, this is not time accelerated. This is more or less real time. <laughs> so, of course, as we're flying through the air, we're demonstrating one of the... Well, one of the concerns that came up, of course, with detonating lots of nuclear bombs in the atmosphere is that you're throwing you know, nuclear fallout everywhere. Um, but it is they are air blasts, so it's not... It's a slightly less of a problem, let's say. Um, <laughs> all the same, I wouldn't necessarily want to be underneath its flight path for you know, long after it, let's say. Um, Dyson, in his papers, he estimated that launching one of these would have a worldwide... would increase the risk of worldwide cancer sufficiently that one more person would die. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that assessment, but then again, you know, he is a very smart individual and so I'm not going to knock him. It's very, it is a very hard thing to estimate. Here, I'm just turning this and, oh man, I'm just going to make it, I think. Look how close we come to that mountain there. <laughs> and so now I'm going up too much, so I have to flip it upside down so I can come back down again. Yeah, they're cutting the power. We're gonna try and bring this thing down relatively quickly. So I'm, I've turned it on its side so we don't get any lift anymore. And turn it. Get it. Get down. Get down. Hey! Look at the look at that landing gear, huh? Okay. Hey! It still has some of its wings left. Thanks for watching. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.